What you're about to watch is a chat between myself and four stringers. Now, originally we planned for the uh, recording to be much longer, but because of the software limitations, we only managed to do 40 minutes, but a second part is planned and we've got like a list of things that we really want to talk about. In this chat, we really just talk about, they talk about themselves for a few moments each, telling you about their history. Plus we talk about the misconceptions and then some of the discussions that follow on from that. And I think that for the average player, it will be really interesting to hear what your misconceptions might be and then the stringers talk about why that's not particularly true. So I'm not sure that everybody's going to enjoy this type of video, but if you do enjoy it, enjoy it, please let us know in the comments and then I can arrange more of them if that's the kind of thing that you're interested in. Anyway, let's get started. Okay, so welcome to this first in a hopefully new series of chats with different types of people. Joining me today are stringers. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Okay, so we're going to go round the screen and everybody's going to introduce themselves and give uh, a little bit of history about their stringing uh, and their playing or their coaching, if that's what they do. So I'll introduce everybody very briefly and then you can take over. So David, would you like to tell the viewers about yourself, please? Certainly. I've uh, been a badminton player since the age of six and my children both followed me into the same sport. And really how I got into stringing was the fact that my uh, eldest son at the age of about 11 or 12 broke a string, which was very exciting. And we went to get a restring from a place that had been recommended to us. And they were looking for £18 for a basic badminton restring. And I handed the racket over, then looked around the shop at the same time, spotted a rather nice Yonex badminton racket reduced to £22 and thought, right, that's maybe better. <laughs> so I took the, the broken racket back went online, started looking for a basic stringing machine, and that's how this all started maybe about nine years ago. Uh, the, the, what really got me into stringing beyond that was rather than just doing the, the sort of the occasional racket for my kids and myself and their friends that they're coaching, was the fact that a colleague at work came in one day having broken his squash strings when playing at lunchtime. And I just said, look, I'd love to try a squash racket out. So told him to buy the strings, said I'd do it for nothing, strung his racket. And about a week later, I got a phone call from his coach to say, you know, look, I'm the head coach at this major sports place in Edinburgh. Did you string this racket? At which point I thought, oh, right, I'm in trouble having made a mistake. But it was actually to say he thought the restring was really good and they were looking for a club stringer. And it's gone from there. So I actually got into stringing to do badminton rackets, did my first squash racket, loved it. And I've really now concentrated on squash because that's where most of my stringing comes from. And uh, the level I'm at now is that I've done a number of tournaments in Edinburgh and all, all of the ladies that make up the Scottish squash team come to me for their restrings. Um, so from the coaching side, yes, I can talk a good chat about badminton, but with squash, I've always looked for feedback from players, uh, always spoken to players. And I, I do feel that that gives me a, a good knowledge to be helpful when helping someone choose their strings. All right. Do you do um, any tennis rackets as well? Yes, I do tennis, racquetball, uh, quite happy to string anything. Oddly enough, when someone hands me a bunch of badminton rackets, now I tend to sort of cringe because really they're such a hassle compared to squash, tennis and racquetball. All right. Okay, good. All right, Jeff, tell us about yourself, please. Okay. Um, I'm Jeff. Um, I am a stringer. Um, it's been six weeks since my last restring. <laughs> it sounds like a, an Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I started um, 20 years ago um, stringing my own rackets, a bit like um, David. Um, so I wanted to experiment with different strings and tensions. Um, come from an engineering background, so always interested in the science and the mechanics behind it. Um, like working with my hands, <coughs> playing with tools, so it seemed like a good fit. Um, then in 2003, um, took a big career change, um, so I came to run the racket shop, um, so I'm stringing full time. Um, I uh, took the decision that if I'm going to be handling um, public, uh, anybody else's racket other than my own, then I ought to have a qualification. So I joined a stringing institute, got my master, master racket technician qualification. Um, off the back of that, I strung at Roehampton, um, so that's my tournament stringing box ticked um, and then ever since I've been working in the shop um, I string around about 30 rackets a week mixture of tennis squash and badminton um, very seasonal for me so tennis is usually busier 
in the summer months and squash and badminton in the winter. Um, but I do have players that, um, that play all year round in all three sports. Um, I see a mix of players, standards. So um, the first one would be kind of complete beginners, novices, rabbit in the headlights. I always think of them. They come into the shop, don't know anything about stringing. There's, my strings are broken. Please fix them. Throw the racket at me. Um, then I've got my regulars who have very um, predefined um, ideas of what they like in their racket. And it's just mm -hmm. a case of doing the same thing again for them, maybe tweaking the tension a little bit, depending on the weather conditions and how they're playing, that type of thing. Uh, and then the third group is the, is the racket nerds where we spend hours discussing different string types, <laughs> merits and, uh, and dis disadvantages before we, uh, before we come up with a stringing setup for them. So that's me. Okay, great. All right, Hugh, tell us about yourself, please. Um, well, I've been I've been stringing since I was eighteen. Um, where my uh, I was playing in a tournament, basically our local sort of county championships at the time, and uh, snapped three strings in one set. Um, and my parents, who were paying for it at the time, said, "For your eighteenth birthday, you would like a stringing machine, wouldn't you?" <laughs> um, so. Uh, so that's kind of how I started. Um, when I was around about 30, started taking it a bit more seriously, um, decided to get myself qualified. Um, so took some ERSA qualifications um, to, to, to sort of help and just try and cement what I was already doing, you know, firm up what I was already doing. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward um, a bit beyond that. So I've now uh, been stringing at tournaments for the last five five years or so um been part of Wimbledon team since 2016 um and, and I work with uh, Paul Skip uh, looking after the RSA UK and in here in the UK um in terms of playing um I, I still dabble a bit in tennis um I sort of play uh sort you know at the county level sort of uh a bit but, but old gits county level very crucially not 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 the youngsters anymore um so yeah, so that's that's what I do. Um, I run, I, I string, well mainly at my shop. Uh, obviously not at the moment, uh, which is with with Topspin Tennis um, with Mark and Karen at my club at Great Missenden. Um, and I've also, as you might see behind me, I've got a machine at home um, as well. And that's that's the one that comes to various tournaments um, and is delightfully easy to uh, stick in the back of the boot. Not so. Um, so uh, yeah. So so that's. Um, that's pretty much that's that's where I'm at. So, and do you do <clears throat> mostly tennis, or do you do some? I do. I do, well. I, I string all. It's predominantly tennis, mainly. I think because of that's I play, and I, you know, my shops at my club as well, and sure. uh, and and. But I do do quite a bit of squash um, and a bit of badminton um, as well when it crops up. Um, so, um, but obviously in 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 the Wickham area where I live, uh, it's also where Mark Lawrence. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it, it works as well, so he's he's you know he's a very competent badminton stringer, um, strings all over the world. So um, you know, like to think I look after the tennis, he looks after the badminton. So. Okay, all right, yeah. and on to you, John. Sorry, you're last, but it's just the way the, the screen went. <laughs> that's fine. I've got the least hair in the group as well, so that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so a bit about myself. So um, I was a county squash and tennis player up until um, sort of under 17s as a, as a junior. Then I decided to just stick with the squash. I loved the tennis as well, but I couldn't do both. Grow, growing up when I was, tennis was very much in the summer, not so much indoor opportunity. Um, and yeah, so carried on with the squash, played to a pretty reasonable level. Um, qualified squash coach level two. Um, been stringing my own racket since I was 18 on and off. Um, I had a period of time when I was at university where I was breaking strings for fun. Sort of every, every week I'd get through at least a couple of, um, couple of sets of string. Um, so yeah, it was getting expensive. It was sort of like 100, 100, 120 pound a month when you're a student, stringing habit. <laughs> so luckily I had a, had a good friend of mine at university called Liam Nolan, whose dad is actually a very famous stringer in, in the UK, well, well known. No, no doubt Hugh probably knows of him as well because he's done, done Wimbledon a few times. Um, and Liam had a machine, so I used to jump on that and have a, have a crack at doing a bit of stringing. Um, and 
when I moved down to the southwest of England from South Wales about eight years ago, um, I decided that I was going to get my own machine because my son was just starting out on his squash journey and he was starting to break a few strings as well. And I couldn't find a string of it with string with the strings I wanted and the tension I wanted. Um, so seven or eight years or so ago, I started progressively getting busier and busier and busier, qualified um, as an ERSA, Master Pro um, Stringer. A couple of years or so ago, I think I was the first person in the, in the world apparently to take that, that exam on the squash side of it. Um, there's a, probably a few more now. Um, and I, I tell you what, the course was really, really good fun actually. Um, I did it with Nick Down, who's probably the most prominent squash stringer in the world. Um, and he's a good friend of mine now and a, and a real mentor. But I also speak to Paul Skip as well on the tennis side, who Q does a bit of work with, uh, with ERSA. So from a stringing perspective, um, I do loads of squash, quite a lot of tennis, because I string for a few tennis pros, um, mainly on the coaching side of it, as well as obviously squash pros at tournaments all over the UK. Um, and I do more badminton than I was originally hoping to do. Um, <laughs> I, I strung for a few people in different clubs and then they've got their friends onto me and it snowballed. And I also do a bit of racquetball string as well because racquetball is huge in the southwest mm. of, of England. So I string for the national racquetball champ, um, Mike Harris, um, the over 40s champ, Mike Gregory, and for my son at racquetball as well. Well, who's the under 15s, under 17s British champ? So I've kind of got the racquetball side of it as, as, as well, but yeah, ma mainly squash. All right. So, what's interesting from listening to all of you is I I'm sorry, I don't know any of the names that you've mentioned, I haven't heard of any of those stringers, I apologize. <laughs> but it, it seems that, that people just do it for themselves and then it's a natural progression into, into a business. Is, is, is that how you'd say that most, most stringers get into it? Yeah, I, from, from my perspective, De definitely I think when you play a sport at a reasonable level um, it's very difficult sometimes to put the trust in somebody else to get the right string set up in, in your racket and that's when you're talking about playing at a reasonable level so if you're a little bit kind of anal on your squash rackets or tennis rackets or whatever rackets then to have a little bit of control and tinker with it is really really good what you don't realize is that you actually have to really do it as a business to sustain it because it can get pretty expensive mm. when you start rattling through lots of sets of strings and buying machines. So to, to do it to any degree, it's worthwhile doing other people's rackets as well. Sure. I mean, does anybody, anybody know somebody who said, that's it, I'm going to be a professional stringer. Let's go. No. <laughs> uh, what from from uh, no from no from no experience at all? You mean? Yeah, I suppose maybe just. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't. <laughs> no, we, we, do, we do have we do have a couple of people who come on courses, uh, swinging courses who, you know, the young, you know, younger, you know, eighteen, nineteen, who who have got that uh in their head um okay. i mean we, we do we do try and caveat it that it's not going to make you a millionaire overnight um you know but but they they have got that ambition and it's you know normally in conjunction with being a tennis coach or a squash coach or or okay. badminton coach um but there are some that you know because there is there there is a i mean paul skip as we've mentioned it i mean he does it a lot more he, you know he, he goes all around the year stringing um you know and uh it, it's possible but it's it, it's it's rare that someone can do that all through the year without without any having anything else in the background um okay. you know it's um so we try we try and and manage people's expectations i mean we we get a lot of we get a lot of uh coaches as well who want to do it to supplement their income which is mm. which is a great idea um you know, and, and we we try and get our you know get with the LTA support, try and get the courses a bit more more coaches aware because there's a, there's a lot of coaches out there. I'm sure we're all aware of a lot of them that that string because it you know yes it does you know helps on a rainy day and that, that's great, um, but they're not necessarily interested in getting qualified and learning to mm -hmm. do it correctly. Whereas they wouldn't have the same attitude with their own coaching qualifications. Yeah, true. Um, and, and they wouldn't be able to get work if they didn't have LTA accreditation and so on and so forth. So, 
so we try to you know to, to get out there and, and and help for that because it, you know it is something coaches can do you know mm. if they can't go on court or they, they want to offer an extra service but it, it, it you know like Paul and I always say it's stringing is it's not rocket science but it can be done very badly if, it, mm. if you don't know what you're doing and and so that's what that's what we try and try and do and you know it's, and, and well, you know, if you're really going to do one of, is to uh, is to flag up on t- on Twitter the horrendous stringing <laughs> jobs that I get <laughs> coming into the shop so <laughs> somebody's decided that yeah I'm gonna I'll watch a YouTube video I'll have a go at stringing um you know, I'll do your racket for yeah. not very much money and then they bring it into me to um, to fix it, it fixed properly <laughs> well it's, it's not it's not just um it's not just you know it, it sounds I'm not getting on coaches cases at all I'm one myself so you know I, I know what it's like and but you know, I string for quite a few tour players. Lucky, I'm quite lucky that way that a few of them happen to live around where I live, and I string and sort their rackets out for them. But when they come back from wherever they've been all over the world to play their tournaments, some of the string jobs they've had at the tournament have been horrendous. Um, you know, and, and you kind of wonder, you know, what what uh, what the you know our president Mark Mclowski tries to do for for the RSA is try to get that standard up mm. at tournaments because it's not fair for players when it's their livelihood to basically you know he wouldn't get you know Lewis Hamilton having you know his, his team putting you know just racking on a set of tyres quickly without any any sort of care or training or anything like that so you know it's not really fair for players to go to tournaments where they're having to you know we're all, all aware of it at the moment having to sort of expense it themselves and so on you know, they're not Roger Federer they're not I, I would to- totally agree with that, actually, um, Hugh. So fr- from my perspective, the majority of frames, certainly on the squash side, maybe not in tennis, but certainly in squash, the majority of frames are made in one of about two different factories in the world over in, um, over in China. Mm-hmm. So the frames are very, very similar, except the balance and maybe the composite they're made from. What really makes a racket different is definitely the strings in, in the racket. It, it, it yeah. really is. I mean, to Hugh's point about Lewis Hamilton and the tyres, Imagine Lewis Hamilton in the set of absolute premium um, Formula One tyres going around a racetrack. He'll do one minute 30. And then imagine him with a set of budget £30 a pop tyres on his, on his car and it would take him three and a half minutes. It, yeah. it's, it's a really good analogy you come up with you there because mm-hmm. that to me is, is the biggest difference. It's not necessarily the frame. It's the, set, mm-hmm. it's the general setup of it. And that could even come down to things like the grip as well. But yeah, the strict strings well, I, I would- yeah, well, I always say as well, you know, that's the bit that hits the ball at the end of the day. I mean, you you can pay, you know, buy a two hundred pound racket, have it strung poorly, and it'll it'll play rubbish, you know. But you can also buy a seventy pound racket, have it strung well, and it'll play a hell of a lot better. Yeah. Um, you know, they make such a big difference. Um, you know, and that's you know, it, it, apply that analogy to demos we have in the shop, which I'm sure you guys all do as well. You know you see quite a lot of shops that have the strings in there until they break, you know, and, and mm. whereas, you know, we, that's not how to demo a racket because if you're buying the latest, I don't know, Rafa Aero Pro or RF 97, and you've got a cheap set of synthetic gut in there that hasn't been strung in three months, that person's not going to enjoy the racket. So you're going to lose out on a sale mm. at the Maybe. end of the day. It, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Hugh. Yeah. Yes. I- and, you know, so it's always, always, you know, try to keep the strings fresh, and um, okay. they're, they're they're the important part. So yeah, so I think it's a really good point. Mm-hmm. I have to agree completely. Um, I've also posted a few pictures of rackets online that have been strung incorrectly, um, string patterns wrong. You know, um, not even using where it's marked on the frame, tie off knot. You know, there's there's no knot there, and uh, I did have a situation where I was stringing the end open and. Some there was a player handed in a few rackets, and he spoke to the manager of the Edinburgh Sports Club where it was being held and said, um, "Is your stringer any good?" Now I was just around the corner stringing at the time, and the place just fell silent. And I was thinking, "Right, what are you going to say to this?" And he thought about it for a moment. The manager and said, "Our stringer is fussy. He's very, very fussy." And there was a few smiles all around, and the chap then quite happily handed in his three rackets. Um, one thing I do hate to hear in discussions about stringing is that horrible question how quickly can you do a racket you know and to me yes we're under time constraints at a tournament but the last thing i would ever want to do is hurry a job you can be stringing with the best string possible as well 
But if you don't do the job right, you know, then you're just not yeah. helping the player. And that's what we are looking to do. Okay. Exactly. Great. All right. So next on the, uh, on the agenda here is, what would you say would be the biggest mis misconceptions that players come to you with? Now, let's just define players. We're not talking about those super nerds who are talking about different tensions for different, you know, for the, for the, the long strings. Or the, no, we're just talking about a regular player comes in. Uh, what would you say would be some of the misconceptions? Jeff, why don't you start with that one? Uh, I, I think the, the biggest misconception is um, I won't be able to tell the difference. Uh, I, if you put whatever string you put in, I'm not I'm not good enough to know. Uh, mm, uh, great feel the difference. Yeah. I think I think that's that's the biggest. I think if um, if you can reasonably consistently hit the ball off the middle of the racket, then you can tell the difference between the strings. Okay, it's a good one. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Any others? One one I get quite often is um, old boys who come in and they want the same string they've had RPM you know, polyester. RPM blast or whatever, <laughs> okay. uh, because they've had it in the racket for the last three years and it hasn't snapped and it's great. And then you look at them, they're playing there, they've got tennis elbow straps, they've got the shoulders, you know, <laughs> deep heat everywhere. And they're like, you know, they, they're obviously, you know, given their age, they don't, they're, they're not raffing the dial on the court, they're not hitting, you know, their top simple ones, not kicking like a mule. Um, you know, and it's sort of ed trying to educate them a bit that they don't, they don't need that that string um it's not really doing anything for them and they'd probably be far better off with with um uh, you know a nice multi-filament you know uh, a sensation xl something like that um because they're obviously not snapping strings because they haven't done um and it'll just be much kinder on their joints and they'll have much more enjoyment and and i get quite a lot of people at the same point as jeff said that you know once they've sort of been been educated i suppose and, and, and made aware of that I've had a few then come back to good God, that made a hell of a difference, you know, mm. in the game, you know, my arms not, not hurting as much or, you know, and, uh, I just, I could feel the ball and didn't realize the strings were so dead before, you know, so right. that, that for me is one of the biggest, not everyone has to have RPM blast in their racket. Okay. So it's a couple of points there. One of them being that a great string is a string that doesn't break. That's what their, their, their mindset is. They come, I've had this for three years. It's a great string. It didn't break. It must be fantastic. And then there's the other idea that, as Jeff was saying, that they can notice a difference. There's a different feel, a significantly different feel to the strings. All right. Anything to I add, that, John? Yeah. Yeah. I think the biggest misconception I have is to do with factory strings. So players buying a really expensive racket, and we kind of alluded on it before, buying a really expensive racket, thinking that the factory stringer will do a really great job because it'll, it'll be absolutely <laughs> top spec because it's been strung in the factory. Well, that's not really necessarily the case. Um, I, have, so, I have a great video to uh, prove that isn't the case. I've, I've seen that, I've seen that right. video, I think. It's quite impressive, actually, the hand skills. Of, there's there's mm. a lady on a string machine. She's just weaving everything with, with one hand. But what will happen with the factory stringers is, is and, and I'm generalising here, they're not all the same, but the factory stringers will basically um, only tension on about the fifth, sixth, or maybe sometimes even the tenth, um, the tenth string that they pull through. So, I've and Jeff, Jeff, um, in your shop um, when you stock your rackets, you'll probably notice when when you're getting the rackets through from the manufacturers from from overseas, is that every single racket, or often quite a lot of the rackets, will come, and some will be really, really tight, some will be really, really loose. Some of the side strings will pull all the way to the frame some of them won't you can t you can tell that sometimes in the factories not a lot of care and tension has gone into the actual string job it's about getting the bracket strung really really quickly and passed out so the odd customer may be very very lucky that they might get a racket that's at the right tension but the vast majority if they buy three of the same rackets from the same batch the string tension will be all over the place so i think the biggest misconception for me is that factory strings are always going to be the best they're okay. really yeah. really not and even most so, manufacturers I mean, will admit that. I can't recall in the whole 17 years that I've been running the shop that any squash manufacturer has sold me a racket, just frame only. Tennis, I can get them frame, on, frame only, and badminton, yeah. I can get them frame only. But squash, they always come pretty strong. Yeah. 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 Back so, in the yeah, day... It would help with that conversation if actually part of the buying the racket thing, which is a lot of what I do in the shop, you buy the racket, we talk about the string setup, 
string it for you and then off you go. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, back in the day when I was squash promotions manager for Dunlop, and we're talking over 25 years ago, the landed cost on a racket strung or frame only was 50 pence difference. So yeah. you're, you're going to say, okay, well, we might as well pay the extra 50 pence, get it strung, and then the people can cut the strings out if they want them. But they don't want them because it's already strung. And for the difference in price, you're just going to get it strung. I don't know how they string it for 50 pence. <laughs> but you trust, trust me, if you see the video, <laughs> you see the video if you alluded to, you'll see. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'll All right. So, David. That video. Yeah. Okay. Send me the link uh, and I'll, I'll add it to the thing. Anything um, great. you want to add for misconceptions? The only. I agree completely with, with what the guys have said. The only other one that I come across occasionally, which is because I tend to be at some of the junior Lothian badminton tournaments to do stringing, is a lot of the kids have the impression that the higher the tension, the better it must be. And if it says my racket goes up to 28 pounds tension, that's what I want it strung at. Mm. Uh, it's usually just a matter of having a, a quiet conversation with the player and the parent who's paying for it to explain the fact that that does not help them and it doesn't help with power at all. And that's the classic one as well. People tend to think, if the strings are a higher tension, I can hit the ball harder. Mm. It's, it's the opposite. So it's that whole discussion about power and control, but it just comes down to talking to the player and, and understanding what they need and explaining to them why you do not want to string their badminton racket at age 12 at 28 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. That's very true, actually. That's one thing that always breaks my heart a little when I, when I you know, mm. sort of see a grade three tournament, junior tournament. And you've got these, you know, these young youngsters there who are very good. They're playing orange ball, you know, very decent level, and you know they they've got uh, an error pro and they've got RPM blast in it. Uh, uh, or, sorry, it sounds like I'm slating RPM blast. Very good string. Like favorite string, is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but a polyester. Let's refer to it more generically. A, 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 right. a nice uh, polyester strung at something like sixty pounds, and they're hitting an orange ball. Um. And it, you know, then you speak to the parents, and they've been advised by the coach that they, they should be doing that to get more spin on it. And you, you sort of, you know, you have to have that conversation. Then, uh, as David was saying, with the parent, just say, has he ever, you know, has he ever snapped a string? Or she? No. Um, hitting an orange ball against a very stiff string bed is a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, it, it, you just have to have that education, and that that's what we, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to do it. You've got to build that education. educate people to be a little bit more um, aware of where they're getting their um, their information from, where they're getting their advice yeah. from. So yeah. uh, you know, the standard one I mean, that we see a lot of is that well, the coach uses this, so therefore that must be good for me. Mm. And, yeah, okay, I mean, we, we, that's what we try to sort of work with a lot of the coaches um, you know, from the shop and the local coaches in the area to try and educate them. You know, that they, they can do what they they're good at on the court, but then. Mm -hmm. You know that they can any tennis and it generally works touch wood um you know and then they come they come to me then to sort of um advice on the strings and things but that, that that's always a little bugbear of me mine when i'm sort of sat there in my shop my shop sort of overlooks the courts and i can see them playing and, and it's and it's mm -hmm. just like no 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 don't don't do that that's you know, they won't be playing when they're 15 because they won't be able to move their shoulder or something, you know. So. Can I just I ask... coach education is really important, yeah. For, 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 please excuse my ignorance, what do you mean by orange ball? Oh, sorry. Um, so in tennis, um, there's diff different age groups. There's different... Um, so for five to eight, you have red, which is a bigger, softer ball. Oh, okay. So they can, you know, and then it's progression. So they progress from red, orange, green, and then to the yellow ball, we all know. Um, orange ball is uh, from eight to nine years of age and then uh, nine to about 11 um, they're playing green ball which is almost you know the pressure is different than each of the ball okay so so if you can imagine that red ball is a big fluffy soft it's like an old sponge ball but a bit more durable like a, a mini um, squash ball it, in uh not so familiar with the squash but a bit in tennis okay. it, it's a, it's a a bigger ball so it's easier for the for the little ones to hit okay and then basically the ball gets gradually smaller gradually more pressure in it as you, okay. as you get up to the age group age groups up to the yellow ball that we all know okay all right so okay. basically an orange ball they're probably around about nine nine or ten and they're that's my point they're then hitting you know it's a soft you know pressure you know not sure. got as much pressure in it flat ball against very dead stiff strings 
not not a great combination. Not good. So it seems to me that we, we've got two aspects here. We've got the aspect of educating the public, and we've got the aspect of educating the coaches because because the coaches are in very influential in the area, as you mentioned. Oh, my coach uses this, therefore it must be the perfect string. Um, what is it you think that stringers can do? To, either as an individual stringer or as an association to, to educate the public more? What can I do to educate the so, public more? So what, one of the things that, that I do, I, I put quite a lot of stuff on my website, which gives hints and tips on tensions and especially with squash. I mean, I, I put more on my website about squash than I do probably tennis, but there is some tennis stuff on there. But it's really just whenever you do something that's a little bit different, you explain why that's different as well. So when you're stringing with natural gut, for example, in tennis, um, it's a lot more expensive than stringing with a multi-filament or a polyester string. The same that it would be in squash or any, any other sport, really. But there's a certain way of actually doing it to make sure that you do a good job. So it might be that you tie off, for example, a gut, um, a gut cross string to a, another gut cross string instead of tying it off against polyester little things like that which will help with durability or help with slippage and tension so you actually advise people when you're doing it and why you're doing it and what the best course of action would be to hugh's point before so polyester um string string that's 60 pounds for a for a junior is absolutely crazy you normally knock off somewhere around about five to ten percent um, on the tension on a polyester string within tennis um, and the same can be applied with certain strings in squash as well to make an allowance for a lack of elasticity or anything else as well so it's really just although you say a lower tension in any racket sport generates more power there are certain strings that might be a bit less elastic or more elastic that might play foul to that kind of rule so you have a whole load of different variables thinner strings thicker strings more abrasive strings slippier strings totally different makeups so there is a real art into doing it so i think explanation is 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 the key and then you can demonstrate why it works that way okay uh, I, think, uh, I think that? Yeah. i think john john's highlighted it there very well in, in what he said it is, is for me is that to, to, to be able to you need the string and a good string it needs to be knowledgeable um, so to be able to give that advice, so, so you basically need to do your homework, which I'm sure we all, all have here, and be aware of the latest strings on the market, what what their characteristics, and and and, uh, and it does help as well if you have an understanding of the game, which I think we touched on earlier that we've all kind of fallen into this, but into the various stringing aspects that we do because of our love for the game that we were playing. So mm -hmm. it helps to have a knowledge of how to play the game. To, to be able to impart that advice that you know so if your if your son or daughter you know speaking to a parent if their son or daughter hits very heavy topspin you know um uh, a regular synthetic gut or a multi-filament is probably not going to be the way to go mm -hmm. um but it's also not just saying no they need to have a polyester end of end of story you need to explain why and have that knowledge and and and, and that bit, you know a good string if you're doing it professionally you know that's why you should be getting qualified and 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 be, you know taking taking you know, the time like, like anything if, if you want to be a, a, a professional tennis coach you know or any in any walk of life i mean i didn't always used to do this i used to work in procurement many years back you know you try and undertake qualifications to sort of strengthen your position strengthen your knowledge strengthen the respect that you have amongst the workplace it's no different in this walk of life as well and that's why parents will then uh, and players, as they get older, will look to you for that that advice. Um, you know, we, we when we're at tournaments, we still get um, you know players coming in, even even at you know very senior professional level, asking our advice. They still want to tinker, mm. even even at that level when they you know they, they've been playing at a much better level than any of us have played. They still want to tinker, but they they you know that they like to go to the stringers to ask what happens if I do this, what happens mm. if I do that. You know, and, and that's why you've got to be, you've got to have that knowledge and have done that homework so that, that you can answer those questions. Okay. Um, Hugh, sorry, John, mm. John stepping in here. Talking about the pro players, um, just want to kind of go on a side issue here. So fussiest, fussiest people looking for string jobs don't tend to be the pros, but they like to take advice mm. and sometimes give a little bit. 
but it tends to be the players that are probably towards the beginning of their journey in, in squash or tennis, but are really, really super keen. And they think they know everything because they've read a couple of blogs. That, that's probably the, that's the hardest thing for me. The amount of tennis players, badminton players are especially fussy, actually, um, and squash players who are complete string and racket geeks when they haven't got that much knowledge of actually playing. It's just stuff they've heard and they've read. And they want that extra advantage. I, I, would you agree with that? Uh, yes. Yes, I, I, def- I definitely um, have, have worked, done some work for players like that. Um, the, the pro players are can be equally fussy. Um, I'm not, obviously not going to name any names, um, but but some you know pro players are very very specific in what they want um, down to the the half pound tension, you know, yeah. and, and um, you know, and you know. But that's at the end of the day, you know, our viewers when we're at a tournament. It's their livelihood. That's what they do. They're well within their rights to to be that fussy. I mean, some want their frame elongated a certain way on the machine um, because they prefer it. But at the end of the day, as we all probably know, uh, you know, in my case, anyway, at a much lower level playing, you want your equipment to be just so when you play. Yeah. You want to sort of, and this is what I've said to a lot of. It's the same analogy I use to a lot of players that I've, you know, prof- um, junior professional players trying to educate them. You know, they've got five or six rackets, um, you know, that they want to have that face. So if they're at six, you know, eight all in a deciding championship tiebreak or something and they snap a string, they don't want, you know, because I'd so broaden the boy, I do a lot of racket customization, making rackets the same and so on. They want to go and get that next racket out of their bag. And they don't want to be thinking, oh, this is the racket. Yeah, this isn't the racket I I don't really like. Because once they've thought that, they've Mm -hmm. lost that tie break. Yeah. Their head's gone. And it's the same. That's the same for the pro players. They they are fussy. They want their frame a certain way. They want their strings done a certain way. But that takes that variable out of of their head when they go on court. Okay. So they can't then then blame the racket. No. Yeah. I'm sorry, David, very quickly, go. I was just going to say, yes, I think it just highlights the importance of speaking to our customers. And although Mm. you might have a pro player hands you over the rack, it says, usual, please. It's still Mm. even that simple question of how did you find the last restrings? And that can initiate it. But I do feel with junior players or newer players to any of the sports that we deal with, you just need to have that five minute chat. What's your game? What's your style of play? What are you looking for out of your strings? Mm. And explain to them why you're making the selection why you're recommending the tension and and giving them the best that you can. Mm-hmm. And the helpful players, the best ones, or the best people coming in for a strange job are the ones that actually listen to you as well. Yeah, okay. I, <laughs> I get that. Okay, so we're going to have to call it a day here. We're going to have to stop simply because we've reached the limit of the Zoom recording. So I've only got like 40 minutes of Zoom recording. I haven't okay. bought a license <laughs> or anything. So I want to take the, this opportunity to thank you. And I'm going to sort of list those um, misconceptions and summarise those points because I think they're really useful for, for people who are watching this video. They will probably be the people who are open to listening and they can take away those ideas. And the next time they go and see their stringer, they will hopefully go and listen to what they've got to say and ask some of the questions that, that we've been asking today. So thank you all very much. I would hope that we can do this again and finish some of the points. If you're all interested, I'd, I'd like yeah, to do that. No yeah, We'd love to. All right, great. Yeah, no well, I, don't, okay. I, I don't know about everyone else, but I missed the chance to tell my funny story. And I'm yeah, we haven't told any stories, story. so we'll have to do that <laughs> for another day. I'm just so nervous. It's just going to stop recording and we're going to lose everything. So I really yep. don't want that to happen. So thanks very much. And look out for the next video. Well, there you have the chat. As I said in the introduction, if you're interested in this type of video, me talking to uh, different types of people, stringers, maybe players, maybe coaches, maybe refs, let me know in the um, comments and I'll see if I can organise it. It's not always possible for me to do that. And, you know, we'll see what happens. As always, if you've got any questions about this, uh, stringing or anything to do with squash, leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to reply. On the screen at the moment is a subscription button. If you think my content is useful, please consider subscribing. It really helps my channel grow. There's also a playlist of some various squash videos that I've made, plus a video that YouTube thinks is a really good fit for you based on what you've been watching. And remember, do something every single day to improve your squash. See ya.